Hi and welcome to this video. It's about depth of field and crop sensor and crop factor misconceptions. Uh, now warning, uh, this is a detailed look into some rather dull technical camera nonsense so just don't watch it unless you're the kind of guy that's going to be into this sort of nerdy stuff. Um, I'll be covering some, some fundamental basics here that you should already know if you're into your cameras uh, but I feel like you need to cover that so you can get everyone on the same page. Uh, but I also want to challenge some common mis misconceptions about crop sensors and depth of field and tell you how to uh, you should be handling that. So let's cover the basics now. So things you, you really need to understand um, before we sort of progress on to the more technical stuff later on. Uh, you need to understand, understand your focal length, exactly what that is. You need to understand focusing near and far and um, how that works and what that does to the image. Uh, you need to understand exactly what your aperture is. Uh, you need to understand crop factor and you need to know the basics about the circle of confusion. So very, very simple stuff here. We have a basic convex lens. Um, obviously, you know, modern lenses have multiple elements and they're way more complicated than this, but they essentially work the same way. So let's keep things simple, but then go into detail, if that makes sense. And then we have a sensor here. This is where the image would be recorded. Obviously, this at one time this would have been um, a piece of film, but now we've got uh, obviously image sensors, um, digital sensors. So focal length, first thing you need to know, it's pretty straightforward when you've got a lens um, and it's refracting the light basically down. Uh, if we have collimated light, which is essentially light that's coming from something which is very far away, like a star or the horizon or whatever, so it's coming straight in um, and it's being refracted and it's being bent down onto a single point. Um, this point here, where it's basically in focus, the distance between here and here, that is your focal length in millimeters. So we have collimated, collimated light coming in here and that converging light coming down to a single point here. So that's how, uh, that's what focal length is. Now aperture, now aperture is obviously that thing when you look inside the lens and you change the f-stop, it gets, it makes a smaller and smaller hole um, and it lets, it stops the light getting in from around the edges of the lens, around the sort of donut shape around the outside and only allows light getting through the center when it's closed off very small. Um, so now about aperture, uh, you should really know what this number is. Basically, you just take the focal length that we just talked about and you divide that by the diameter of the aperture and that equals your f-stop number. Um, so a couple of examples, if you get a 50 millimeter lens uh, f2, the aperture is gonna be 25 millimeters across, okay? If you have a 35 millimeter f2, then the aperture is going to be 17.5 millimeters across. Now what this means is the same f-stop number should basically be about the same level of light. There's going to be some imperfections in you know different lenses and different bits of glass and all the rest of it. So that it's not always exact, but essentially it should be uh, a good representation for what um, the amount of light that's getting in so you can match exposure between different length lenses. Uh, something you should know about um, when your lens is wide Obviously, you're letting in more light when you have a, a, narrow, a narrower or shallower depth of field, uh, and there's less light diffraction um, going on. So, um, but you also are more susceptible to any imperfections in the glass. In the actual glass elements, will show up more when you've got a wider aperture. So, let's close this aperture down. So, at the moment, it's got this. You know, f, let's imagine this is a very fast lens, and it's f 1.2. It's fully open. Uh, if we stop down once, f2, stop down again to f2.8 and again f4, f5.6, you can get increments between these, but basically this is a stop each time, so it's half as much light for each stop. f8, f11, f16. f22 is often the smallest uh, aperture that you're going to get on a lens. You can go smaller on certain lenses, uh, but it's, it's often a sort of um, your, your smallest point. Um, and what you should know about smaller apertures is obviously it's letting in less light because you've got this whole big metal shutter in the way and only light is getting through this tiny little space in the middle. Um, it has deeper focus and it has more light diffraction because we won't get into the physics of that, but basically just so you should know when your aperture is shut all the way down, everything can get a little bit fuzzy. Even though you've got a, a larger area in focus, uh, all the, edge of the edges of things can get a little bit fuzzy because of light diffraction. Um, Okay, so this is often the sort of illustration you see when people talk about this stuff. And I'm not going to get into like tons of detail, but I just think we need to go into a bit more than this to understand what the hell's going on with depth of field and all the rest of it and what's going on inside your lens. So 
let's start with the very basics. Let's have a subject here which we're taking a photo or a video of, uh, and we have an apple, and we have light coming in from what, whatever source, you know, window, doesn't matter, direction, doesn't matter. Um, what it does in terms of is creating shadows and stuff, but basically we have light coming in from whatever source. And let's imagine this red blob is a tiny, tiny speck. It's just large for um, ease of uh, viewing. And that tiny speck is then bouncing light off in all different directions. It happens to be red. There's a bit of red skin here. Uh, so the other color light rays, you know, blue and all the rest of it, are being absorbed. And it's only red that's bouncing back off in all different directions, scattering red light. Now we're not interested in the bits of light that are shooting up and over there and down there. We're only interested in the bits of light that are getting into the lens because, you know, we're talking about capturing this image. So let's imagine these light rays are being bouncing off all different directions. They're all getting into this side of this lens and they're being refracted down into uh, a single point on our focus plane over here on our sensor. Now, first thing you might notice is the image is upside down over here because that's what happens with your news lenses. Everything gets inverted. That now, in my silly illustrations here, I've just done a simple sort of one single bend uh, as it goes through the lens. But technically, for each barrier between air, glass, and air, uh, it's going to be refracted um, at the barrier. So, if we imagine this is glass and this is air. That's the point where it bends, basically, and it's, it's basically refracted. And it, how much it bends is, is down to the index of refraction, which is basically the speed that light can travel through that medium. Uh, and it's the barrier at each point at which um, is the bend point. So, OK, so that this may be a little bit confusing. So let's just, uh, my science teacher taught me this in a very simple way, very sort of Sesame Street way. And it stuck with me, so it obviously worked. So if we imagine our light rays is a troop of, uh, you know, soldiers all walking in a straight line in formation, walking across tarmac at a fairly brisk pace because it's a fairly easy uh, surface to walk across. Now, they've, they reach this sort of like um, uh, end of the pavement, basically, and they've just got a beach here. So this is sand. Now, sand's slower to walk through. It's harder to walk through. So as they start to hit it, they slow up and as this one hits it and then this one hits it and then this one hits it what happens is they all bunch up together and slow down because they were going quite fast across the tarmac here and when that happens they tend to veer off in one direction slightly because they're all bunching up on one side and they end up going at a slower speed in a slightly um, slight angle in this direction so that should hopefully help un uh, explain what happens with uh, light refraction and what is going on at the barrier point. Okay, so let's get back to our, our simple model. So if you imagine this is our focal plane here, this is, I imagine, our, our focus plane here. So this is when it's in focus, this is when it's in focus. So we have this point coming in, tiny little red spot there, tiny red spot there. And we have, imagine, another point down here, light being scattered off, and that's being pushed up to here because, again, the image is inverted. Now let's get into our depth of field and think about some areas of the image that aren't in focus. So let's imagine a point further behind. So this, everything on this line is the same distance from the lens. This is now further away. So if you're focused on this plane here, this will be out of our focus plane. So let's get rid of the apple and this uh, on, on an edge, um, on an isometric uh, drawing of a sensor here because it's slightly misleading. So we want to be looking at it as a dead straight line because it would be parallel to the lens, obviously. So, okay, so now I've, I've kind of drawn in this depth of field area here. So if we imagine that this is a, we've got our, our lens uh, wide open and our, our point back here is now out of focus. Now, now what you should know about this is that What's in focus? There's there's one there's one single plane, which is technically in focus, and that's this one here. Anything, any any there any um, amount outside of that is technically not in focus anymore. But there's going to be a grey area which is going to be acceptably what they would call acceptably in focus, depending on your the resolution that you're capturing. So if you've got a super high megapixel um, camera, like 50 megapixel camera or something, this is going to be really quite small because when you blow up those images large, you're going to be able to see that something you thought on a you know a thumbnail on a small image was in focus now looks out of focus. 
Um, so it depends on the medium that you're capturing and the resolution and various other factors. Uh, but you should know there's only ever one plane that's in focus. Even with a tiny aperture, there's only ever one plane that's technically totally in focus. And outside of that, there's just grey areas of acceptably in focus or out of focus. Subjective, basically, depending on the medium and your eye and how close you're looking at it. So, now that's out of the way. So now we have this point here which is behind what we are saying is acceptably in focus. And what's happening to our, the same point on this side, as we can see it gets projected behind our sensor and is over here. And if we look at our cones of light, because our cones of light are spreading out, the reason why this bit is, is acceptably in focus is because our cone of light hasn't spread too far yet. But as soon as it gets to here, that would definitely be out of focus. This is only a tiny bit of out of focus. But our bit that's being projected behind its cone when it's hitting the sensor is quite a large look. So that's why that's technically out of focus. So now let's bring an aperture into the equation. So let's keep in mind the shape of this cone of light. It's a big old fat wedge and it's coming from all different, all, right the way across the whole of the uh, lens. Now when we close down the aperture and only allow light in from the center, rather than a very sort of converging big wedge of light for each one of these specks, the tiny points of detail in, in, in the image, we've now got slightly more sort of spiky collimated light. So it's still converging down onto a single point, but the cone is much um, tighter. It's more of an ice pick rather than a big sort of pyramid um, cone shape. So what that does is it extends our depth of field. So our cone, when our cone is um, here, it's now only out of focus when it gets that far away from the sensor, whereas before it was out of focus much closer to the sensor. So, and that obviously has a counter effect on the outside of the lens in the real world. So now this point that was, uh, wrong way, this point that was behind outside of our depth of field acceptable in focus area is now in focus. So that, because we've closed our aperture down, that point, all of that is now in focus. So maybe that was, you know, possibly someone's face behind this person, this plane, they're now in focus. But behind them, still blurry, but they're technically now, the, the depth of field has grown, so they're in focus. Uh, so that's quite important. This is, this is more converging light, so this is more collimated light. And of course, there's less of it, because we're blocking a bunch of it out. Same amount of light is physically getting into the front of the lens, but it's just being stopped before it gets onto the sensor. So, next, let's look at shorter lenses and wider, uh, shorter wider lenses and longer narrower lenses. So, shorter lenses, first thing you need to know, obviously the, the distance between these two points is, is now smaller. Um, the lens technically would be a different shape, uh, but we're keeping the same simple little shape. I don't want to get too much into lens design, let's keep things simple. But the main point, of, the main thing you need to know here is that light is being gathered from a much wider um, field of view, basically. So it's coming in, from, so we can see above the apple and bo below the apple, and the apple is now starting to look quite small because that image from the apple is now projecting into a smaller space in that lens and being shot sort of straight back onto the sensor, much more bunched up together, which is giving us our deeper depth of field because of these, these cones of light and then more ice picks again, rather than big fat wedges. So that is why shorter lenses with wider field of view have a deeper depth of field. And the opposite obviously happens with longer lenses. So longer lenses have a narrower, tighter field of view. Uh, there's a bigger distance between the lens and the the focus plane or the sensor, whatever it is back here, film. Um, and now what's happening is the light's coming in kind of like straighter. It's still being scattered out in all different directions, but it, it's coming in more collimated um, big chunks and then being spread out over a wider area, basically. Uh, so now our big wedges of light or cones are fatter again, which is giving us our shallower depth of field again. So just keep that in mind. So a longer lens will give you a shallower depth of field, a wider lens will give you a deeper depth of field, even though everything else is the same, the distance, the object, and all the rest of it. Okay, so now when the subject is near, 
that's also going to give you a shallow depth field because you've brought this object that which was quite small and all the way over here you've brought it up closer to the lens the light that which would have been coming in a more sort of collimated uh, strands is now coming off in big old wedges big old cones and that's being scattered off into the lens from a sort of wider area and then coming off into a wider area so when the subject is nearer the lens you've got a, a shallower depth field Okay, so now we have our subject far away. Let's imagine this, this apple is over there, off screen, quite a ways. This illustration doesn't do it too much justice, but I didn't want to complicate things by changing the scale. But, but imagine that the apple is far away and these light rays are now coming in in much sort of straighter lines from the subject. Uh, and they're basically coming in in more sort of spiky lines uh, once again compared to our near subject. They're much, they're much reduced down and pointier. And that's giving us our deeper depth of field. So when the object is far away, basically, we will have a deeper depth of field um, than if it is close. Um, okay, so now sensor size, let's bring that into the mix. So same, same lens, same object, same focusing distance. The only thing we're changing is the sensor size. So the cone of light doesn't change with this lens and this setup, but the sensor size does. So as we can see now, the apple's kind of partially off the sensor because we've got a tighter view. Um, but what you need to know, the depth of field for the lens is the same, because the image is the same, the image being projected by the lens is the same, but the depth of field on the smaller sensor appears shallower. Now this is because of what happens to the circle of confusion. So let's just go into that, then I'll show you some real world examples of this, because this is one of the, the things that's going to be quite contentious for some people. So circle confusion, you need to understand the basis of this. It's basically down to what's acceptably in focus. So let's imagine, let's bring things down to real simple levels here. Uh, I've got a very low resolution camera sensor here, 19 by 10. Now let's imagine this, this, this green spot is a point that's acceptably in focus on this sensor at the moment because it's basically fitting into one pixel. Each one of these squares is a pixel. Uh, if it starts to overlap other pixels too much, it's going to start to become a blurry blob, but right now it's a single point. Obviously in a high resolution uh, sensor, these are going to be crammed together and this, this dot's going to be much smaller, but it's just keep things simple and keep it low res just for, a sake of, for the sake of simplification. Um, now, what's going to happen if we keep this image the same, this point of light the same, but we change the size of the sensor but keep the resolution the same? This is what happens. Our point of light that was in focus and only covering one pixel is now covering about four pixels. So it's now starting to become out of focus because our sensor is smaller. This is why, this is what's called the circle of confusion because the circle of confusion has essentially grown relative to the sensor. So we've now got more areas of uh, the shot which is out of focus. So what does that mean? It basically means a smaller sensor camera has a shallower depth of field. Let me repeat that. So if all the other factors are the same, a smaller sensor camera has a shallower depth of field. Now this is counterintuitive to what many people say and think about uh, these things, but it's the facts, okay. So the reason why is the circle confusion has stayed the same for that lens, but the pixel density is higher on the smaller sensor in terms of area. So the outer focus of areas that we're just a little bit out of focus, have now become more out of focus, so they're blurrier. Okay, but importantly, it also has a tighter field of view, which we're gonna come on to now. So here's a full frame, here's my four thirds, which is basically one quarter of the size. So real world examples. Let's get into this now. So the same lens, same settings on two different size cameras, so everything's the same apart from the sensor. We've got same distance, same lens, same aperture, uh, same ISO, same shutter speed, not that that matters, but uh, everything's the same apart from the sensor size. So what we can see here, it's essentially the same image, but we've cropped in onto a smaller area, which is exactly what's happened, because it's throwing the same image back. Uh, it's just a couple of photos that I took um, uh, in my studio a minute ago, just for the purposes of this. Um, now, I focus just here on this little cross on the, the color chart, uh, but what we can see is this looks blurrier than this because we're, we're closer to it. It's as simple as this. This is still in focus, this is still in focus, but this looks blurrier 
you know, if this was a bokeh ball, this bokeh ball is quite large compared to this one, so it looks more out of focus. It's technically the same amount of out of focus, but because we've, we've cropped in on it, and I haven't cropped in on it, the image, this is the full image of the sensor, this is what the camera has done by cropping it. So, this is where people often either change the distance of the subject, they step backwards with their crop sensor camera to reframe things and get things the same frame, or they change the focal length to match the framing. Uh, example, if you go from a 50mm on a full frame, they'll pop on a 25mm lens on their micro four thirds to get the same framing. But remember, everything we've, we've talked about earlier, the focal length, the distance of the subject, and the aperture, these are all part of the depth of field equation, and they all affect our end image. You can't change one of these without changing the others if you want true equivalence. It breaks fundamental mathematics to do so. So this brings us to lens equivalence, crop factor, and how most people get it wrong. So hopefully you know what crop factor is, uh, CF here. We basically use full frame as the sort of uh, the baseline, not for any particular reason other than there's a hell of a lot of people that had 35 millimeter cameras back in the day, and that's the way lots of people started to think. So we use that as, so full frame is basically one, there's no change. APC is 1.5, or if you've got a Canon, it's 1.6, because they like to be different. Micro Four Thirds is times two, so that's nice and easy to do the math, so that's why we're, we're working on that here. And it's simply an adjustment that we make for lenses on different size sensors to get the same field of view. If you apply the crop factor to the focal length, then we can match our framing. You have to also apply the same crop factor mass to the aperture to retain a formula that gives true equivalence. So here's what we should be doing. Applying the crop factor to the focal length and the aperture. Example, Micro Four Thirds has a two times crop factor compared to full frame. So if you have 50 millimeter F4 lens on a full frame and you want the same look, same everything, you will need a 25 millimeter F2 on Micro Four Thirds. So we've applied the crop factor to this to get that and this to get that. Pretty simple stuff, but people don't do this. So remember, we're not talking about matching the exposure here, but we're talking about the field of view and the depth of field. Also, as a wonderful extra bonus, when we do this and do everything properly and equate our field of view and our depth of field correctly, we can also match the noise levels between different size sensors, as we are now giving both sensors the same total amount of light. Okay, so some of you are going to be asking, so why is the exposure different between these two? because I've not yet explained what we then do to our ISO. Now you must first understand that the ISO number is misleading. It gives you the total amount of light hitting a square inch of a particular sensor, not the total amount of light hitting the whole sensor that creates our image. And that's what's important, is all the light that's creating our image. So it's the total amount of light that's important, okay? So by doing this, we can achieve the same results as a full frame camera on a crop sensor as long as you've got a fast enough lens. So the next step is, once you apply the crop factor to the focal length and the aperture, you then have to apply the crop factor squared to the ISO to match exposure and noise. So then everything is the same. So let's have a look at that. This is the whole formula. So for the, the complete crop factor adjustment, we need to apply the crop factor to the focal length, focal length as you probably already know and to the aperture, uh, same crop factor, and into the ISO, we apply the crop factor squared. Okay, so, so there's three things, so all you gotta do. So real world, real world examples. So here we now have uh, a full frame, micro four thirds, they both have now native lenses. So we've done our crop factor on our focal length to get the same framing. Now, I just should, obviously just mention that this is, uh, the micro four thirds is slightly squarer than the uh, full frame, it's just the aspect ratio of framing is as close as I could get it. Um, but you should obviously n keep that in mind. So a full frame is now at 85 millimeters. Right, our micro four thirds is at 42.5 millimeters because we applied our crop factor. Our aperture is at f4 and our aperture is at f2 on the small sensor because we've applied our crop factor. Our ISO is at 800 on our full frame and it's at 200 on our micro four thirds and the shutter speed is the same. And what we can see here is 
the same amount of blur. If we look at these bokeh balls on this car back here, on this toy car, at the same size, we've got the same amount of noise. If we pick an area up here, and pick an area up here, we've got the same exposure, we've got the same depth of field, everything is the same because we've done the mass and the formula and the crop factor all properly and we've done it for the aperture we've done it for the iso and we've done it for the focal length if you do all the maths right you can see achieve the same results in two completely different size sensors remember this sensor is a quarter of the size of this one and yet apart from a few small differences in terms of um, color and you know the way the sensors interpret the light Everything's the same. Everything that's important is the same. Okay, so that's your real world examples of you know putting this into practice. So, so why what about this whole squared thing that might have confused you slightly? So let's just talk about that briefly. So our micro third sensor is basically um, one quarter of the size of full frame. So now that these ISOs start to make sense in terms of total light. So if we take that Micro Four Thirds sensor and we drop it into our full frame, I'm just gonna do this quickly and crudely. Um, so you can see it's four times the size, basically. It's four times the size. So if you then imagine this ISO 200, so we have 200 in this one, 200 in this one, 200 in this one, 200 in this one. That makes our 800, see? It all works out perfectly. So you can physically show this, you don't need to do the maths, you can physically see this sensor is a quarter of the size, therefore you have to do uh, the crop factor squared to give you the equi equivalent ISO to match the noise levels. Because when you do that, when you put this at ISO 800 or this at ISO 200, they're both getting the same amount of light, the same total amount of light. Remember the ISO number is only giving you the amount of um, light per square inch or per whatever it is, it's, just, it's the same square area, but because this sensor is larger, it's gathering more light. It's four times the size. Anyway, so this is why the noise levels are different. It's not because there's anything wrong with the crop sensor, the technology isn't inferior, it's just smaller. So you've just got to accommodate for that in your formulas. Anyway, so there you go, That's that covers that. Um, I know this is a bit of a wordy page, but let's just get through it. So I know this might be a bit confusing and it's slightly con contrary to what you've heard before. So per perhaps a better way for you to look at the difference between larger and smaller sensors is the larger sensor camera gives you the advantage of a wider field of view, allowing you to use longer focal lengths to achieve a shallow depth of field. Also, it's gathering more light due to the physical size of the sensor, hence lower noise at the same ISO number. So in order to better understand your own requirements when you're buying a crop sensor camera or lens, do the crop factor math on both the focal length and the aperture to retain depth of field and field of view and light gathering abilities that you require. And to match the noise levels and exposure, apply the crop factor square to the ISO number as well. And for the full frame fanboys out there, of course, if you want to say it's easier to get a very shallow depth of field at a specific field of view with a larger sensor, then you're quite right. As a big... As the bigger sensor allows longer focal lengths to get the same framing, but it's not the sensor doing this, it's the longer focal length. Once you realize this, you can work out how to get the same results on a crop sensor. Lens manufacturers themselves have been getting this stuff intentionally wrong and misleading consumers when they market crop sensor lenses and cameras and state full frame focal length equivalents. But then, importantly, they don't give the same equivalence for the aperture. So it's no wonder there's so much unnecessary confusion on this subject. It is often the case that consumers don't get the results they want from a crop sensor simply because they got the lens equivalence and crop factor wrong when they bought the gear. They didn't do the maths right, basically. So, please make sure you understand this stuff when you're buying new gear. Better educated consumers, uh, force manufacturers produce better products to match expectations. We have seen more uh, fast crop sensor specific lenses arriving on the market recently. A good example of that is a Sigma 18 to 35 f1.8 for APS C. And I think this is because consum consumers are starting to cotton on and get their head around, heads around the facts and they're not swallowing all the lies and misinformation anymore.
We're now demanding very fast lenses for our crop sensor cameras so they can fully compete with the full frame equivalents. Once you've got your equivalent fast lens for your crop sensor camera, the last hurdle to jump over is the lower base ISO. Remember, if we are squaring our crop factor for the ISO, we will obviously reach a ceiling when we can't bring our crop sensor camera ISO low enough to match. Uh, so to match the noise levels on a full frame at ISO 200, a micro four thirds camera would have to be at ISO 50. So the minute we start to get these very, very low numbers, then you know the perfect condition type shoots when you're always working at your base ISO, uh, then you know they'll be able to complete across the board. Um, okay, so there's one more thing that I'm sure some of you want to know about, if I've not mentioned yet. Can you guess what it is? Speed boosters. Okay, so we've talked about our lenses and our focal lengths and all the basics and circle confusion, all that stuff. Speed boosters tend to confuse a lot of people and they think it's some sort of magic thing. It's a great thing, don't get me wrong. It seems to get a bit confused by it. So uh, I just went straight to, I don't want to get into illustrations for that, I want to get straight uh, through to a real world examples. So here we have same lens, same aperture, same ISO on two different cameras, micro four thirds with a speed booster now and our full frame on the left here. Now, it doesn't match exactly. I mean, it depends on your model speed boosters. Some uh, magnify better than others. Um, but as you can see, the framing's a bit different. Um, but what you should probably spot is that the depth of field is very, very similar. Technically, you would probably say that this, well, not probably, but technically, you'd say that this has a shallower depth of field. But that isn't because it's changing the lens. Again, the speed booster is behind the lens. It's not magically adding more light or doing anything magical to anything. All it's doing is shrinking the image down. So rather than it be all being spilled around the sensor like it is with a dumb adapter, it's simply less of it is being spilled around the sensor. The image is the same. I mean, technically, because it's going through another layer of glass, it's probably slightly darker, which again, confuses some people because they say, oh, it's getting, giving you an extra stop of light. It's giving you an extra stop of light if you if you and if you believe the ISO lies. Remember, this ISO is misleading because it's only telling you about the um, the light fall per square inch, and this sensor is much smaller than this one. And I know this this gets a bit confusing, but just get your heads around it. All the all the speed booster is doing is just reducing exactly the same image down to a smaller space, so less light is wasted. There's still more light being gathered by the full frame sensor because it's it's you know pretty much filling the whole circle of light coming off the back of the lens some is still being wasted beyond this but less is being wasted so in in long um, you just need to know that speed boosters are good but they're not magic it's not magically making the depth of field different technically compared to remember our our example with um, the dumb adapter when the background looked even blurrier. Technically, the speed booster is making the depth of field wider than it is with no speed booster, but it's also competing on the field of view. So this is why people like them, because you're getting a field of view which is more similar to a larger sensor. That is the important thing, that is the important change, is the field of view not the depth of field. Okay, there we go. <laughs> it was a long one to get through, but hopefully I got through it as quickly as I could. Um, thanks for watching. I hope it was useful. Feel free to comment below. I'm sure you will do, because I know this is contentious for a lot of people. Uh, and I have no doubts if I got anything wrong, I, there's probably a couple of typos in there. Apologies for that. Uh, but if I got anything seriously wrong, then point it out, because this is my understanding about it. It is science, and it should just be fact, but you can still uh, make mistakes and get things a bit wrong. I will correct any, any mistakes that get flagged or anything that I notice. Uh, I will put an annotation on. So if you're on you know standard YouTube, you should spot those, and you'll see if I made a mistake, and I'll point it out. Um, if you're still confused by any of this stuff, I learned a lot from watching these videos. Hopefully I um, put a bunch of what they said and I made it a little bit possibly clearer, hopefully, by adding all of my illustrations and going into the real science of what's going on in, inside the lens. Um, but these two guys are great. The filmmaker IQ guy, he's brilliant. 
uh, he explains things really well, probably better than I do, but very, very sciencey. If you want to go into the science of things, uh, watch him. If you want to go into the more sort of the gear side of things, but certainly the science as well, Tony Northrup, his videos uh, covers a lot of this, and he taught me an awful lot. So if I didn't do it for you enough, I didn't explain things well enough, uh, go to these two guys, um, and hopefully I'll put some links in those uh, for those videos below. Okay, guys, I'll sign out there. Um, I need a drink of tea after all that talk in one take. Uh, I really hope that some of that was useful, and I hope um, it's educated a few people. Uh, certainly a year ago, I didn't know a lot of this stuff, so I've learned a lot in the last year, and hopefully I'm passing it on. Like I said, the more, the better educated consumers are, uh, the better gear we can get out of these manufacturers and stop the, the buggers from lying to us. Um, anyway, peace out, guys, and I hope that was useful.